uh, January. Gosh, is it still January? It feels like, oh, I don't know, halfway through the year or something. Uh, but this January, to start the year, we've been looking at a series called First Things First. Oh, oh, look. I think I'm, I'm going to try it, Gavin. But if I, if, I'm like, if I just get distracted, then can you just take over? <laughs> um, so... Um, And we've been asking ourselves, uh, you know, if we're followers of Jesus, um, what should our priorities be? What should be the first things, the important things in our life uh, be? And to help us to do that, we've been uh, looking at some of the things Jesus said uh, on the Sermon on the Mount on how to live life well. Um, We've been particularly looking at uh, Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6 where he says, uh, when you give, when you pray, uh, and then later on the chapter he says, when you fast. And there's this basic assumption that as Jesus followers we'll be doing, we'll choose to do each of these three things. The issue is, is not about whether we give or pray or fast it's, it's but how and why so on the first uh sunday of the um of the year sam kicked off the the series talking about fasting and feasting and he uh, spoke about how it's important that as christians we do both of these things that um yeah that there's a place for feasting and celebrating who God is and all that he's done for us. And that actually in our feasting, there's something of a witness to, to those who uh, don't know Jesus yet of, of, um, of God's goodness and what he's done for us. But there's also a place for fasting, for abstinence from food or other basic needs as a sign to ourselves that we need God even more than these basic needs, uh, that we want to prioritise him above, above everything else. And last week at the start of prayer week, Ed went on to talk uh, about talking and listening to God. So prayer, uh, in other words, he spoke about our need to invest in private prayer, uh, which develops sort of that personal, intimate relationship with God, as well as our need uh, for public prayer, to meet together for public prayer, which encourages us and inspires one another. And you can catch up online if you've missed either of uh, those talks. But this week we're talking uh, about giving and keeping. What are we called to give away and what are we called to invest in? But as I was preparing to to speak this morning, I'm aware that I haven't got a funny or personal story to share with you this morning. And um, and I just, you know, I was thinking, gosh, I could do with something uh, just to keep the mood light, uh, just to keep you all awake. Um, So uh, I haven't got a personal funny story, so I'm going to tell you a joke. The problem is... I'm not good at telling jokes. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> so I tell, I try to tell a joke at the start of uh, Alpha each uh, each week when we're running the Alpha course. That's the point that Steve runs into the room so that he doesn't miss uh, my joke. He's not the joke he's interested in. It's, it's to see how badly I tell the joke. <laughs> But this one's a tried and tested one, Steve, so we're going to go for it anyway. Okay. <laughs> Just prepare myself. So, it's got a little bit to do with sort of money and giving and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, only tangentially. Um, so, this guy uh, goes on holiday to Jerusalem in Israel. He goes on holiday with his, his wife and his uh, mother-in-law. And while they're there, while they're in Jerusalem, uh, the mother-in-law dies. So the couple go to a, I'm sorry. So the couple go to an undertaker, and um, the undertaker says, uh, "Well, we could ship the body home for you, but it will be probably at least five thousand pounds to to do that. Or we could bury her. We could do a burial uh, here." And that will be £150. And the guy says, we we were going to ship her home. 
And the, the, the undertaker says, are you, are you sure? Are you sure that you know, 5,000 pounds is a, it's a lot of money uh, and we can do a really nice funeral here? And the guy replies, look, the thing is, 2,000 years ago, a guy died here and was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. I can't take that chance. <laughs> is that all right? <sighs> okay. So you've got to stay awake for me now after I've gone through that. So we are looking at Matthew chapter 6 and we're starting um, at verse 2. Uh, So Jesus said, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Skipping on to verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then just verse 24 as well. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I'm going to be showing um, the verses on the screen uh, behind me. But if you want to follow uh, in your own Bibles, then it's, it's Matthew chapter to 6. So giving and keeping is our topic for today. And first, we're going to look at why we give. Uh, But let's just be open to God uh, challenging us about our motivations uh, for giving, how we give and what we're giving. You know, January is a good time starts of the year to step back and be inspired to set some bold objectives for the year ahead. So we read in verse 2, Uh, so when you give to the needy. And as we said already, it's clear that Jesus expects us to give to the needy. So apparently the word give uh, appears 921 times in the Bible, almost as many as faith, hope and love added together. I haven't checked out all those 921 verses, but the point is that the Bible talks time and again about giving, about sharing. Um, So, for example, the Bible says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So that means you don't just uh, give God the leftovers. And it also says, and do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So this verse challenges us to give sacrificially. And in Matthew uh, chapter 5, the the, the chapter just before we've been looking at, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You know, share and lend your possessions. Don't hold on too tightly to things. You know, we give because we're told to by God. It's clear in the Bible many times. If we want to follow Jesus... Uh, we need to be obedient to his teaching and we also want to follow his example. He gave the ultimate sacrifice of his life for us. It said that when we become Christians, three conversions take place. Conversion of the heart, conversion of the mind and conversion of the wallet. The act of giving is part of what it means to be a Christian. Part of following Jesus is recognising that our money, our stuff, uh, is not our own. It's given to us to steward, to look after, 
Uh, I remember when uh, the Stewart family um, moved to Mozambique for a year to work with Oasis uh, a, a few years back. Benji Stewart uh, lent Isaac his, um, his games table. Um, it looked a bit like this one. It was fantastic. It was uh, a pool table on the bottom layer, air hockey and other games on the middle layer. And then on the top, there was table, uh, there was table football. And um, now that games table uh, remained the possession of Benji, but we were looking after it. We got to use it and we enjoyed it. Uh, but we made sure we cared for it really well because it wasn't ours. It, it was someone else's. And it's the same with our money. We, we work hard to earn it. Uh, but God is the one who gives us our abilities, our gifts, our energies uh, and our jobs. It's his money that he gives and he's got a right to direct it, uh, to direct how we use it. And we give to the needy. Because others around the world need it more than us. Nearly half of the world's population, more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. 1 billion children worldwide are living in poverty. Uh, 805 million people worldwide do not have enough food to eat. There are thousands and thousands of statistics that I can show you that highlight the fact that if you live in this country, then you are very, very rich in comparison to the majority of the rest of the world. If you have a home to, to live in, if you've got electricity and heating, if you've got clean running water, if you've got access to healthcare and to education, then you are are one of the richest people in the world. It's good to share what we have with others. You know, one of the first things we teach our children uh, is to share. It's to share. We explain it's good to share our toys. You know, when a toddler holds on to a toy and says, mine, as they often do, we don't applaud them or encourage them by saying yes and don't let anyone else play with it. We, we don't do that. We explain that it's good to share, that I encourage them to be generous and, and not to be tight-fisted. Now, sharing looks different when we're an adult than when we were, uh, were toddlers, but the principle is the same. It's good to share with those that don't have. You know, you could share with someone like Casita in the yellow t-shirt. He had to grow up really quickly when his parents died of HIV um, five years ago. At the age of 15, he was left to look after his five siblings in order to provide for the family. The three eldest children had to drop out of school and work on local farms. Send a Cow, um, the organisation Paul Stewart works for, is helping to support that family. Or you could share with someone like Beatrice in Kenya who was struggling to grow her market stall to provide enough money for her family. She received uh, a small loan and training from an organisation called Five Talents to support her business. And now she, uh, she can support her church, her family and orphans in her community. So we give to the poor because God tells us to and because there's plenty of need in the world. But we also give because it's good for us. Our passage says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When we give, just like when we fast, it cuts through the power of those other things that can ensnare our hearts, like money, longing for security, comfort, earthly pleasures. Um, Nikki Gumbel, who is the, the pioneer of the Alpha Course, says, giving prizes our characters from the constricting grip of materialism that destroys so many lives. John Wesley, the 19th century theologian, said, when I have money, I get rid of it quickly, lest it find a way into my heart. 
Giving is good for us. It's an investment in our spiritual health. Um, I just want to tell you a little story about Hudson Taylor. So he was the founder of uh, an organization called the China Inland Mission. Uh, and in the 19th century, he went to China. And he saw many thousands of people um, giving their lives to, to Jesus. And, and some would say he, he laid the foundations of the, the Christian church in China today. Uh, but at the age of 27, he was preparing to travel to China for the first time, and he was living a really frugal life. He was asked uh, one evening to go and pray for a very poor man and his wife who was dying. And the only money he had to live on himself was, was a half crown uh, coin in his pocket. It was uh, equivalent to about, it was equivalent to two shillings and sixpence, apparently. Um, and uh, it, was a, a, it was one coin that he had in his pocket. And he wished at that point that he could have had change. It wasn't just one coin, that it was, it was change. And that he would have given a shilling. Uh, he would have shared a shilling of his money uh, to the family. And he could have kept the, the, the shilling and sixpence for, for his needs to feed him and to, to look after himself. But when uh, he arrived at the, the house, the woman was lying in bed, uh, accompanied by several children and a day-old baby. The family had no money left. And he wished at that point that he had change in his pocket so that he uh, could, f- could give uh, a shilling and sixpence to the family and keep just the shilling for himself. He tried to tell them about uh, his heavenly father who loved them and wanted to help them, but struggled to find the words as he was aware of this coin in his pocket. At that point, he would gladly have given them the two shillings and kept just the sixpence for himself. But as Hudson uh, began to pray for the family, he was convicted of his lack of faith that God could provide for him uh, if he gave up his final coin. So somehow he finished the prayer and made the decision to give the coin to the family. Uh, and even though he only had enough food for himself for another, another meal, the family thanked him and, and the woman's life was, was saved. And he said that joy flooded his heart at that moment. He sang all the way home, even though he had no money left. The next morning, the postman delivered a package for him. The handwriting on the front was blurred, uh, but as he opened it, there was a pair of gloves that uh, he took out. And when he took them out, a a half sovereign fell out. That was four times the amount he'd given away the night before. He'd received a 400% return on his investment in just 12 hours. That's a pretty good return, isn't it? It was a defining moment in his life and ministry. And it was one that, he, that encouraged him to have faith in Jesus many times through the rest of his life. You know, giving, especially sacrificially, can build our faith in Jesus. It's an investment in our spiritual life. And the Bible also tells us that giving to the poor is an investment in our eternal life. So Proverbs 19 verse 17 says this, He who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his good deed. Now we might get a little bit queasy when we mention rewards for giving. It's a little bit of a sensitive subject. We don't want to give the impression that when we give, God gives uh, us money back necessarily like that story of Hudson Taylor. But we can be certain that God will provide for us and that he will honour us for our giving. Surely, uh, but um, Jesus spoke quite a lot, quite a bit about heavenly rewards and heavenly treasures. 
Let's just look at verse 19 again that we, uh, we read. Do not dis- store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we invest in treasures here on earth, we invest in houses or possessions, or in bank balances, then moth and rust consume them. It's only treasures in heaven that are permanent. If we want treasure in heaven, we need to send it on in advance. What we hold on to in this life, we're going to lose. But what we give, we are going to keep forever. You know, there's nothing wrong with good earthly investments in our pension plans or in our bank accounts. But let's not have that as our main motivation um, or our only motivation. You know, giving to the poor is the best investment we can make. It's way better than a pension scheme or stocks or bonds or investment in housing. Any return on those investments will only last until we die. But giving to the poor will reap rewards for eternity. Giving to the poor just good economics. So we've looked at why we give. Now let's look at how we give. It can sometimes be difficult to work out how uh, we should give, given our particular circumstances or given our particular personalities even. We know don't we, that being good stewards, uh, looking after our money and our resources that God has entrusted to us is is a good thing. But holding on too tightly to things and our stuff is, is bad. It's not a good thing. Putting our trust in our resources rather than our trust in God is not what we're called to do. We know that worrying about tomorrow is bad. Matthew, uh, Chapter 6 goes on, the passage that we're looking at carries on to say, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's an encouraging verse, isn't it? Um, But we shouldn't worry about tomorrow, yet it's good stewardship to plan for the future. Perhaps to pay into pension schemes or, or to save up for large items in our, in our house that, that, we, that one day we're, we're going to break down. It's good to give generously and sacrificially, but it's not good to go into debt unnecessarily or to be frivolous with our money. It's tricky to work out the balance of all of these things. But there are a number of principles that we can look at. So we're going to look again at verse uh, 3 and 4 of uh, Matthew chapter 6. Oh, and verse 2 as well, sorry. Uh, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what Jesus is saying, that if we give in order to get honour and glory... Uh, from others, then that is exactly what we'll get. We'll get honour and glory, but that's all we will get. If we want a reward in heaven, uh, then don't look for honour on earth. You know, sometimes it can be helpful for people to uh, to know that specific people are, are giving to them, are praying for them, are supporting them, are, are sort of cheering them on. Um, but it can sometimes be good to give anonymously as well. It allows the glory and honour to go to God instead of us. Um, a few months back, Neil and Lindsay Davy, they're not here this morning, but uh, I just asked them whether they were happy for me to share this. But a few months back, uh, as many of you will know, that the whole house was flooded while they were on holiday. And... Um, 
a few weeks later, they, uh, Lindsay was round at, at my house and Ed had just collected uh, from the white um, box just by the, the welcome desk um, an envelope with Neil and Lindsay's name on the front. And Lindsay was uh, round at my house. We were just having coffee and a catch-up uh, when Ed passed on the envelope and, and she opened it. And it was an anonymous gift of money. Um, and they were so blessed. They were both really blessed by that gift. And, and Lindsay was just desperate. As she was opening it and just as sort of looking, she was desperate to say thank you. She really wanted to say thank you. But because it was anonymous, she had no person to say thank you. So she just had to keep saying thank you to God. So God got all the glory and thanks. And when we give anonymously, the glory and thanks goes to God in, instead of us. Uh, in verses 3 and 4 of our passage, Jesus goes on to say, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, that's sort of figurative language. It's not sort of um, actual because, of course, your, yeah, your right hand and your brain and it's all connected. Um, but what Jesus is saying is to avoid the danger of self-congratulation, of, to avoid the danger of pride in ourselves and, and what we've done. We're scarcely to know what we, uh, that we've given. We're not to dwell on it or think about it or, or uh, sort of congratulate ourselves. Um, uh, this guy, A.B. Bruce, a uh, Scottish theologian, um, I, I, I like this one. I, um, it's really helpful. It's a sort of a maxim that I think is really uh, helpful and challenging. Um, and he says, we are to show when tempted to hide and hide when tempted to show. I think it's a really helpful uh, yeah, thought for us. But before we finish, uh, there's another passage I want us to look at in 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 1 to 2, it says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So Paul here is laying out some more principles about giving. He's saying on the first day of the week. In other words, before anything else give. As your first priority, give. You know, you've probably heard the saying, big rocks first. I don't know whether you have or not, but it's, it's, the, um, it's the idea that life is busy. I'm going to show you big rocks first. Uh, life is busy uh, and our time, energy, money is constantly in demand. Work commitments, family, friends, uh, household chores, ministries, entertainment, it fills our time. Uh, the time in each day is finite and we struggle to fit in the things that we say are really important, the big rocks. Life gets filled up very easily and we constantly feel pressured and disappointed that we can't get to the things we say are important. You know, life can look a bit like that jar on the left. But if we make sure the important things are done at the start of the day or scheduled first or given priority in our, in our diaries, then the other less important stuff sort of fits in around it, like the jar on the right. And it's the same with our bank balances. We might say giving is important. Uh, it's a priority to me, but we give by looking at what's left in our wallets or purses at the end of the, the week, and, and it's not very much. Or by what's left after we decided what we are going to spend on other things. But if you believe giving is a priority... Make it the first thing that you set aside from your income. Put that big rock in first and let the finances fit around it. So Paul says the first day of every week. You might not receive your income uh, weekly. You might get your income monthly. Uh, but the principle here is it's regularly. 
let's make uh, giving a regular habit. And then in keeping with your income. If you, keep, uh, if you decide a percentage of your income to give, it will mean that you'll be giving in keeping with your income. If your income goes up, then your giving will go up. If your income goes down, then your giving will go down. It will be in keeping with your income. But as we just sort of come into uh, to land, I want us to look at one extra passage this morning. It, it sums up a lot of what we've been thinking about this morning. I'm aware that I've read lots of verses um, uh, for, to you. Uh, but as I said, there's lots of verses in the Bible about, about giving. Um, so we have got, this is 1 Timothy 60, uh, 6, verse 17 to 19. So command those who are rich in this present world. As I've explained already, that's us. If we're living in this country, uh, we are enriched in comparison to the vast majority of the world. So command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good needs. So notice that play on words, encouraging us who are rich in earthly things to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So I'm aware that uh, I haven't actually spoken much about the me- actual mechanics of giving here at Highgrave, you know, because we want church to be a place where guests feel welcome, where people who aren't part of church feel like they can come and explore and that there's no compulsion to, to give their money uh, away. So sometimes we can find... Uh, giving the information about how to give at high growth is can be a little bit tricky to sort of track uh, track down you know giving is such an important part of family life of making family life happen but it's also uh, resources our outreach and mission in the world I know a number of people uh, earmark some extra giving through church to go to particular projects working with the poor. Uh, For example, some people uh, give money to send a cow that I've uh, mentioned already, or to pass a kodjo in uh, in Togo, or to open doors um, working with persecuted Christians around the world. There's a way that we can uh, give through church to, to those projects but if you want to know anything more about giving then then speak to ed basically uh or uh look on the the website um and there's quite a lot of information on there yeah so there's lots of information this morning um but we need the holy spirit to give wisdom and freedom and conviction Uh, of what it is that we're asked to give, what he wants us to give. So I just want to finish by praying. So let's just take a moment. and I'm going to pray and then invite Tom and Rosie back. Father God, thank you for all that you provide us with. Help us to see money, our money, with your eyes. Give us your perspective, the right perspective on our finances. I pray, Lord, that this year, the start of this year, you might call out of us a new level of faith in you, a new level of generosity, so that we might be able to take hold of the life that is truly life as Timothy wrote, as Paul wrote to Timothy. I pray, Lord, that you'll be at work in our hearts even now, (coughs) guiding and uh, helping us to plan. Thank you, Lord. Amen.